all for coming. I am here to provoke you by using Comic Sans. I am here to talk. Um, I use this event as a excuse to kind of confront my love for things that are ugly and cute. This is a decoration I saw at the Alameda Flea Market, which if you haven't been, highly recommend. It's the only thing I like in Oakland. Um, that's not true, I love Oakland actually. It's just a funny punchline. Okay, so we're gonna talk about ugly cute. I own five fanny packs, this is three of them. Uh, I think they're amazing, like they're not ironic, right? These, these are fanny packs that I love. They're ugly and they're cute. Um, I acknowledge ugly things that happen to me all the time by taking really cute selfies. Uh, so we have the, the, the eye, big giant eyeball one that's from this beauty app that allows you to like try on makeup. I have no idea why it lets you do that. Uh, that's me putting on lipstick in the car. Uh, that foot is me having a lack of self care and then at least having fun when my toenails grow that long. Um, it's disgusting. When my children were born, I did not send out cute pictures of them to family and friends. As much as my mother would have loved for me to do that, I sent pictures of my placentas. There were two, because there was twins. The doctors were horrified that I wanted a picture of this and not my children as soon as it came out of me. Sorry, is this better? <laughs> a little bit more palatable, a little bit cuter. Um, the thing about what I love about this kind of stuff is like, I actually wasn't trying to be funny. I remember my legs were still in the stirrups and I had two kids that were screaming out to my right and I begged my husband to take a picture of the placenta and I wasn't, like he was so annoyed with me at the time, but I just, I, I don't know, like, I reserve my irony for kitsch. This isn't kitsch, this is really just, I'm fascinated by the human body. Kitsch, I do love. I like when, when we, you know, we got a house and, and I was like, okay, this is my opportunity to landscape the front yard. And I mocked this up. And I don't know what's wrong with me. I just, this was my vision. And I don't understand what I find about ugly so mysteriously appealing. So we're gonna talk about cuteness and how we experience this emotional pull to things with behavior that appears harmless and charming and yielding. A scientific name for this is baby schema, which manifests as exaggerated features, like a large head, cute little piggy, uh, saucer-like eyes, and a round body or a round head, because they remind us of babies. And a study by Drexel University notes that the way we notice and fawn over and feel a need to care for cute things is shaped by our evolutionary response to ensure our own survival, right? Because cuteness doesn't just trigger an immediate response of, of awe, but what is that awe? It's about empathy, it's about compassion, and it's about caregiving. I mean, look at that little hamster. I don't even like hamsters. But look how cute he is. I have, a, I have a, um, a colleague, Clarissa, who when she's having a bad day, I know, because she has a bunch of these kiwis on her computer, and she looks at them when she's feeling sad. They make her happy. Now, some scientists have argued that we're drawn to animals that don't look like human babies, but they behave like them. This is actually a picture of my twins <laughs> in my backyard. A baby elephant, for example, doesn't have, you know, the, the big eyes and the cute little nose, but it comes from the fact that it's clumsy and playful, and yes, that reminds us of children. How oh, cute is that? Oh, cute. Okay, okay. So that, of course, explains this little dude and our obsession with puppy videos and cute little kitty videos. <laughs> <laughs> and dog and kitty videos, <laughs> and hamsters eating breadsticks. <laughs> Corgis getting vacuumed, otters playing basketball, and sleepy, sleepy ducks. 
<laughs> I can't pronounce this animal. I tried it a bunch. It's, it's, it's like oxytol. Do you guys know this animal? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There, and this, this little guy's just smiling. There's like fan, there's fan pages for this old dude. Okay, because once we have in our head that something looks like a baby or acts like a baby, we tend to exploit it a little bit further and applying it to other non-physical characterization. And we have become obsessed with cute. And we're getting cuter and cuter and cuter. So what is cute? At its very essence, I suppose it's generally characterized as being helpless and easily exploitable. Uh, so this little dude, right? Okay, so. Um, there was a study at the English, uh, uh, at Stanford University, an assistant professor named Cyan Nagai uh, has this great quote where she sees cute as, quote, the, the aestheticization of powerlessness, and quote, response to weakness that revolves around the desire for ever more intimate, ever more sensual relation to objects already regarded as familiar and unthreatening. Daniel Harris, author of Cute, Quaint, and Hungry and Romantic, The Aesthetics of Consumerism, says, it takes it a, a little step further and says that cuteness is, quote, a dehuma, uh, dehumanizing, paralyzing its victims into a comatose or semi-conscious things. In other words, he wants cute to get off his lawn. He does not like cute. So let's talk about Hello Kitty Pikachu, both of which have big round heads and plump little bodies. Their traits are both aesthetically and in their disposition, they embrace innocence and gentleness and vulnerability and weakness, exactly like a baby, right? So with that in mind, it makes even more sense while we fawn over cute, ugly creatures like this blobfish. Because no matter how gross you think a blobfish is, it's also innocent and vulnerable too. I mean, look at his lips. Look at those lips. <laughs> He's so helpless. This is my kind of cute. Cute is also ugly. It has that sort of it's so bad it's good vibe that like William Shatner's acting has or a low budget horror movie has. So we have this little guy. He's called an AA. He's from Madagascar. He's a nocturnal primate. And he has a sort of skeletal feature, but large cutie pie eyes. And so uh, researcher Hiroshi Mutano of Hiroshima University suggests people like, uh, people like me <laughs> who see an ugly animal and experience a feeling of, quote, whimsical cuteness that doesn't activate our protective instincts like the cute sweetness uh, images do, but instead gives me a sense of joy and levity. In his words, ugly cute is just funny. I love these shoes so much. As soon as I saw them, I wanted them, but they were like a million dollars, so that did not happen. P.S. Have you ever visited cute.com? This is what it looks like. <laughs> Just as an aside, cute.com, this guy has it on lock down. Okay. Cute is aggressive. Have you ever seen something that was so cute you wanted to cuddle it and suffocate it? You just wanted to squish it and kill it? <laughs> no? <laughs> I look at my, so I, I personally agree with that actually, but it is a very common phenomenon. And it is, has to do with people who experience a strong emotional feeling and then it's counteracted by another strong emotional feeling. So you see this with um, nervous laughter. You see this with the popularity of tears of joy, right? Uh, crying tears when you're proud of someone. We don't have not one, but two tears of joy emojis. The second one's also known as the Rafa emoji. Uh, but if you're crying, you don't use these guys, right? You use these guys. Um, not this guy also. If you're crying, if you're sad, you don't use this guy. This is the guy you use to say, uh, you, you, uh, like, hold on. This is the kind of guy I think you would say to say, um, oh my God, it's so funny, I'm crying, right? But you would never use it to say, I'm so sorry for your loss, right? That's not what you do. Your body doesn't feel like that. Your body feels like that when you are 
seeing something and you're overwhelmed by the emotion, but not sadness on sadness, right? So you use it when you're proud of someone. I'm so proud of you for graduating or whatever it might be. And it's these emotions that seem inconsolable that this person is happy even though they're crying. <laughs> this talk is so easy to get a response from you guys because I just show a bunch of gift cat gifts. Um, so this conflicting feeling is when you see a cute cat animal, right? Or a cute animal, it doesn't have to be a cat. And you want to cuddle it and you want to protect it. And one proposed explanation for cute aggression is, is fascinating. It was explored by a social psychologist who hypothesized if, you're, if you find yourself incapacitated by how cute a baby is, so much so that you simply can't take care of it, that baby is going to starve. And so in her paper, she quote says, our study seems to underscore the idea that cute aggression is the brain's way of bringing us back down by mediating our feelings of being overwhelmed. So basically it pops you. It, you look at your kid or your whatever it is that you're looking at, it's so cute, and you're paralyzed, and then, and then you're like, I'm gonna squish you. And then you're like, oh, that got me out of that, right? So it like shakes you, and so you can take care of the kid. And you see this all over the place. I'm gonna cuddle you so hard. What, really? I don't cuddle that hard. That's, that's something different. So I'm not cuddling anymore. So this is something that a lot of people commonly feel, so much so that we see it all over Google Images. Uh, so this had me start to think more about how cute isn't just about powerlessness, right? So we have mouthless, fingerless Hello Kitty. And it wasn't until I became a parent that I realized that Hello Kitty isn't so innocent, right? She actually holds all of the power because in her cuteness, in her perceived innocence, she is making a demand of me to like her and to take care of her, much like my kids did when they were born. My two cute terrorists. They are the cutest terrorists you will ever see. So this idea of cute questioning our assumptions about who has power and to what end can be vividly conveyed in our headlines. So this is a polar bear in Berlin named Cute Nut. Uh, and he attracted uh, millions of followers online, commanding almost as much tension as we hear about uh, hard news around war, around politics around any number of things. And it's not that one is more important than the other, but that there's actually a dialogue happening. Because when a world feels like a dumpster fire, whoop, <laughs> we are also seeking to make dumpster fires cute because it's so overwhelmingly intense to think about the world, you would be like, oh, at least it's cute. This is available on, uh, uh, I found it on Nerdist if you're actually into these final things. Um, so what about this space between sweet cute and uncanny cute? Surely there's room to operate between these two extremes, right? So I like to think, so I work at, I work at Google, I work on the emoji program, and I, uh, the, the, sadly the blobs were a version of the emoji from a few years ago that were retired before I started, and I, love them. They are a really good example of how cute can break down dichotomies that exist in culture and how it reflects how culture has evolved, right? So this idea of good and bad, knowable and unknowable, body and soul, like I look at these and I don't know if these are souls or if these are actual physical bodies. I don't know, even like the dichotomies of, of man and woman, feminine and masculine, aren't even reflected in here as well. They, I don't know what gender these little characters are. Adult and child, are they young? Are they old? And sexual and non-sexual. Do I wanna fuck these guys? <laughs> I'm fascinated by the erosion of borders that cute operate in. And you see it in culture now. You see the breakdown between, of gender becoming more ambiguous. My daughter loves looking like Freddie Mercury and my son loves putting on dresses with his sister. And this is amazing. This is not something that would have existed not that long ago. So what if this subversion of boundaries is central to Cute's popularity? 
perhaps this is why cute lacks clear identities, allowing ourselves to project ourselves onto them. This is a fantastic chart by Scott McLeod, who talks about the notion of abstraction and how it's possible for drawings to convey the idea of something more clearly when they take as much detail away as possible, rather than literally reproducing reality. So I don't know what those blobs were, right? They were just good little friends. This guy's just dancing. It's not a man. It's not a woman. It's not an adult. It's not a child. It's not an animal. It's not a human. It's just dancing. Now, cuteness erodes the borders between what can be seen as those distinct realms. We think of the child now as always present in the adult, in your career, in your relationships. And we see the collapse of the notion that even humans are separate from animals in that we start taking care of the planet. And yet now, in the emoji ecosystem, or at least in 2015, we have these ladies. These are the exact same emojis, just slowly getting more detail as our retina screens get more fidelity. And there's one thing that's for sure. These ladies are not cute. They are not cute. They are sexualized. They are kind of kind of hot, maybe. And worse, they're more specific. This was supposed to be an emoji for just dancing, and now it's clearly flamenco dancing. But what about boogie woogie or Polynesian dancing or any number of other kinds of dance? This dancing emoji has become iconic of something very different. And now I can see up her skirt. So we have gone from just in a few short years, something that conveyed the idea of dancing, the idea of celebration, to this woman who is having a good time. No, no, she's having a good time. I will never take that away from her. But it's just not cute. Oh, the other point I was going to make is that as we add more detail, as we add more emojis, so for example, yesterday there was a big announcement around new emojis. We've now gone, uh, we had 400 emojis about seven years ago. Now we have 3,000 emojis, right? So as we add more emojis, as we add more detail, we're effectively creating zones of exclusion without consciously trying, adding more detail. We have now eliminated so many other kinds of dance because of this. So, okay, let's talk about authenticity. Because cute truly flies in the face of authenticity. If you think about modern ideas, of sincerity and authenticity, we assume that each one of us has this sort of authentic self, at least a set of beliefs or values and tastes that uniquely identify us. And uh, in its most uncanny forms, cute kind of steps aside from that. It kind of just is itself, and it, you can kind of, it doesn't really tell you much more than what you see on the outside. And we see a lot of that playing out in a social capacity through selfies. So self-portraiture after all, has long served as a means for, self, uh, for the self and identity and exploration. And for some, it's figuring out who you are, especially when you're a teenager. And for others, it's projecting how you want to be perceived. Yes, even as an adult. And sometimes it's both. And young minds look for identities to try on. They look for causes to relate to. And given how their values are validated or, or not, they disregard them or they become rooted. And the internet grooms this culture through different means of illustration and filters. And the beautiful thing about illustration is it lets you deviate from reality. So what if cuteness is fundamentally an appeal to others? Social psychologists Gary Sherman and Jonathan Haidt go so far as to consider the cuteness response as a, quote, moral emotion, which caught my attention. And they go on to say that it's, quote, direct releaser of a human sociality that draws in others into our circle for moral concern. It's enough even to overcome otherness. Internet culture is teeming with this, right? Memes are a, aren't just disposable jokes, but a source of safe and reliable intimacy in an era that seems to be racing towards an explosion of fears. You can't even be shocked anymore. Being shocked is a meme. Right? You can't be, you're, you're shook now. So memes actually offer you an escape and also force you to look it in the eye. And emojis aren't just avatars of soulless commercialism or ways to escape self-indulgent, empty, uncommitted existence. 
they are a way of personalizing in an unpersonalized world. Simon May, a visiting professor of philosophy at King's College, argues that cute is, quote, the spirit of our times. And after World War II, he claims, citizens of Western Europe and the United States, and especially of Japan, were seized by a desire born of revulsion against violence and cruelty for innocence, gentleness, civility, and cooperation. Other philosophers note that with the except of some intellectuals and artists, the post-war generation did not embrace the indeterminacy of human existence. If Japan did maybe cute, Germany, Germany definitely did remorse, right? Nonetheless, if you do a search for cute on Ngram, you do see this dramatic spike not, uh, that is happening actively right now. And these days, we're going full hog on cute, right? Like five billion emojis are shared a day on Facebook. Emojis are effusively cute. They allow you to say something to someone so they know that you're not threatening, which in terms probably means the message that you're, you're sending will land well. And if you look at people who are trying to communicate with emojis, most of the emojis people send are affectionate. So according to a study published last year by Gretchen McCullough and uh, Lauren Gaughan, they looked at most common emoji sequences in Swift B and have a, they have a high level repetition. Lots of hearts, you've all done this, right? You see something online that you think is cute or is nice or your friend has said something good, you send back a bunch of hearts, right? Like an exclamation point. You just, it's like a beat gesture. And you also do this with, with laughing. Sometimes just one tears of joy does it, sometimes three, and sometimes you wanna actually pace it in between two smiley faces. And half, this is so interesting, half of the most popular non-repeating emoji pairings, meaning you didn't just hit the same button twice, are about love, right? So the most popular non-unique emoji bigram is hard eyes and kiss with heart. The second most used is kiss with heart and heart. Hard eyes with kissy face, hard eyes with heart. So you're starting to get it, right? Like people are expressing affection and love. So ugly and cute may seem like opposites, but without one, we would not have the other. I think goldfish are amazing. Look at that creature. Those eyes, you couldn't get bigger. <laughs> you couldn't get bigger eyes on this guy, right? I think ugly and cute really does embrace this. I have an inexplicable attraction to Tom Petty. His heart, I know he's not really cute, but like he is, I don't get it either. So here's the deal, and this is the truth. I don't love these things just in spite of the fact that they're ugly. I'm drawn to them because they're ugly, because there's something about that blend of ugly and cute that I just find so mysteriously appealing. And yes, you can buy all of these things on amazon.com. So thank you, that is cute, and it's been lovely chatting with you tonight.